I think we've uh, we realised from seeing people's uh, um, responses there that we've actually started. Um, uh, apologies for the slight sort of uh, blip there, but hello, welcome to the Leg International Real Estate Webinar for this Tuesday, the 10th of October. My name is Andy Davies, and for the next hour, uh, we will be talking to our panel of wonderful experts about property in France, about whether you want to buy a property in terms of holiday or actual permanent move. And uh, what we always do is we um, say hello to our panelists and then we get straight amongst the questions. But I will say in advance, if you do have a question, a burning question, uh, please, on your box, you'll see a question box, uh, fire it in, and if I will do my very best to try and get to it. But we do have questions that have been submitted in advance, and I will get to those first. Okay, let's say hello to our panel members. We always start with Joanna, she's always with us. Hello to Joanna Leggett. Hi everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Joanna Leggett, so I'm part of the Leggett family. Um, we've been established in France since 1998. We all live and work in France and we offer a very good hand-holding service um, with agents all across France to be able to help you sell or buy a property in France. So welcome everyone. Thank you, Joanna. Let's go on my screen, right uh, from left to right, we go over to Alison with two L's. Alison with two L's. Hello, Alison. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alison grant Luness, and I am the creator of Your France Formation, the author of Foolproof French Visas, the admin of the Americans in France Facebook group, and I help people get the right visa and do all of the admin setup to create their dream life in France. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Let's go to Andrew. Andrew says property expert next to his name. Bonjour à tous. Hello, everybody. Andrew Guck here. I am a local legate agent here in Carcassonne in the south of France. And I've been with Leggett for going on four years. And I live in, um, I've lived in Carcassonne for five years now. And I really enjoy working for Leggett. And I've, um, I've got a great group of people that, uh, that work down here on our team. So if you're interested in looking for a property in the sunny south of France, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to help you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Andrew. Let's talk to Paulette. Paulette is, is normally with us. So let's say hello again to Paulette. Hi, uh, my name is Paulette Booth. I'm the co-founder and manager of Agence AXA International, and we're an AXA agency providing all AXA France products, but with uh, a team of English speakers, and in most cases for the main uh, insurance as a summary of your, your quote in English, so you know what you're getting. We can also open uh, bank accounts as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Paulette. Say hello. Alex has been with us before, so hello, Alex. Hey everyone, I'm Alex. I'm a private wealth manager at Chase Buchanan. I am a UK and US qualified financial advisor with a history of working in France, and I previously lived both in uh, the French Alps and in the Southeast. Thank you, Alex. And finally, uh, last but no means least, with us every single time, Jonathan Watson. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, thank you, Andy. Good evening, everyone. Yes, my name is Jonathan Watson. I'm Associate Director here at Lumon. We're an international property currency specialist specialising in France, helping clients all over the world move money in and out of the country for property transactions. So at this time in the webinar, I would just like to launch a poll, which all of you should see on your screens now just to help us provide relevant information to do with this type of transaction looking at some of the timelines for some of you uh, as to where you may be in the process of looking at property in france obviously it's not something that happens overnight so understanding some of the timelines that our viewers are going to be working towards can really just help to give us a little more information to try and target some of the responses to all of your questions that you've provided so thank you very much everyone for responding to that poll i can see the numbers coming in uh, quite strongly there so that's really good thank you very much and then there's just one more poll that i would like to share with our audience just before we get into the thick of things you should see another poll on your screen now in terms of a financial position towards making an offer Again, this is all really relevant information for us, particularly for myself with the currency side of things, the money aspect, clearly a very important part of the transaction. And Lumen certainly has a number of different ways that we can structure payments and how you're arranging your costings just to ensure everything goes through smoothly. So thank you very much for your responses and I'll pass back to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. OK, as I said, if you do have a burning question, there is a question box. Uh, fire it in and I will do my best. It may be one that's sort of fed off an answer that's already been given. And if I see that, I will uh, obviously uh, expand on those uh, questions that I've already asked. Let's start with Joanna. Joanna, uh, we always start with you. and We've uh, said hello to you first. Mark Reynolds says 
if a property has been on the market for a while, what is the norm in making an offer? Do you go in 10, 20 or 30 percent lower? Um, well, to be honest, in the current market and the market we've seen over the last two years, um, in the old days, uh, going back before those two years, you know, properties could stay on the market for six months to a year before they sold. Um, in the market at the current market at the moment, we're seeing properties come on the market and sell within three weeks. So if you're going to put in a really low offer, it, you're very unlikely to get the property. And there may be another offer that's coming in, um, you know, that the buyer's putting in at full asking price. So we have seen that over the last two years. And that's, you know, not normally the case. Um, the best thing to do is to talk to your agent because the agent will know the situation of the, the vendor. He'll know, you know, are they looking for a quick sale? Have they already discussed? that they might take a lower price um, have they already lowered the price to the the current value that it is at the moment and um, so the best thing your agent is working for you as well as the vendor so they'll be able to negotiate the best price for you sometimes in France I mean I know we see these TV programs particularly in the UK like a place in the sun where they put in these cheeky offers and it's like 40% off or 30% off that generally doesn't happen here and um, you know putting in these really really low offers sometimes can offend the person so much that they wouldn't sell it to you even if you put in a higher offer particularly with some of the rural areas in France you know they'd be very offended by that so you have to be careful I would always take the advice of your local agent they know the area they know the property they know if it's at the right value um, and sometimes you know your agent will advise you oh my god this is such a good price they've reduced it they've done so much work etc etc I would say as a guideline 10% um, you know unless it's been on the market for three years and needs loads of renovation then yes of course go in lower but if it's a good prop property and it's well well maintained, well looked after, it would be silly to lose the property to another buyer by putting in a very, very low offer. So I would say as a guideline, I would go to 10%. I don't know if Andrew would agree with me there, Andrew. Yes, I, I agree. 10% would be a, a good starting point. It's not to say that that offer would be accepted, but if, there, if you see the property has been sitting on the market for a while, then yeah, 10%. If you see a property that just went on the market a couple of weeks ago or yesterday, you're likely not going to get it other than offering the full asking price. And keep in mind, we don't go above the full asking price in France as you can in the U.S. and other countries throughout the world um, that, that take many offers over the year to full asking price. Okay, thank you, Andrew and jo Joanna. That, funny enough, you've just answered that, Andrew, for me. Uh, Catherine Bruce just came on and said, do properties ever go over the advertised price? I live in Scotland where properties are marketed offers over the price. Well, obviously, you've answered that for us. So, Catherine, no, uh, the advertised price and then what Joanna and Andrew are saying is 10% is possibly the norm, but you may be also offending people with even with the 10% offer. As Joanna said, the market is very strong at the moment. Okay, Alison, let's go to you. Um, Anne Carrera says, can you apply for a visa before buying a property? Yes, there's no requirement to own property before moving to France. So if you want to come over here and get established while you're still looking for a property, we certainly have people who do that. In that case, we advise that you get, you know, an Airbnb for the first couple of weeks or a short-term rental in a jeet or something so that you're able to explore the area. Then you take that time to look for a longer term rental where we're going to be able to validate your, your visa, register your business if you're working, um, and, then, and then you can move to the property you purchase and uh, change your address and everything. But yeah, there's, we have many clients who come over who are planning on buying, but they're not exactly sure where they want to settle and they just want to get over here and start living here and take the time to find exactly the right property for them. Thank you. Would you say then that it's probably quite advisable to try and get your visa in place first so that then you sort of basically know you can come and live here? It certainly doesn't hurt. Um, there are some people that are very nervous about the visa coming through uh, and they want to secure that before they come over and, and invest all that money in, into a property. I wouldn't say that it's a bad idea. That being said, if you are buying a property cash and you have enough resources to support yourself and you're coming because you're retired and you're not planning on working, then there aren't there isn't really a very high chance that your visa would be rejected. So we do have people too who buy a property, who use it as a vacation property for years, um, or who are going through the purchasing, uh, you know, procedure at the same time as they're preparing their visa application and they're not overly concerned about their visa getting rejected. Thank you. Um, you will have noticed with uh, our panelists, three of them have American accents and we've had a lot of uh, 
registration from from uh, US viewers uh, this evening. So um, I'm going to ask Andrew this one uh, from Melissa Soat. I think it's how you pronounce it. Says, please talk about buying and living in France for an American. That's for you, Andrew. Talk about buying and living. In buying France and living for an American. Yes. Could sorry, could you repeat that? Again? Yeah, please talk about buying and living in France. Okay. For the, the process is quite straightforward. As, as Alison said. Buying and living in France for an American, yes. As Alison was saying, you, there's no requirement for the visa to come over here. But if you do plan on staying full time, you would need that visa to, to live full time in France. Otherwise, if you're just coming here as a tourist and you want to stay for 90 days out of every six months, then that's not necessary. And the buying process is just the same as it would be for a French um, a, a French citizen as well. Uh, the first step would be to, to start locating the area where you'd like to live. I recommend doing that long before you, you start visiting properties. It's quite common for, for people to want to start visiting properties that they fall in love with before they've actually settled on a, on a location. Uh, that's, that's the first step. So decide where you'd like to live, maybe do a reconnaissance uh, trip come to France, visit various locations, maybe start off in Paris and, and take a trip down to the south, visit me here in Carcassonne, uh, go to, to various regions. Once you locate the area that you'd like to live in, then I would say come back another time and then that's when you should start, start um, visiting properties. And typically you're going to want to start booking the visits of, uh, at least a month or a few weeks in advance. I recently had people come uh, just last week and ask me if they could visit properties on Saturday, but my agenda is booked a, a week in advance and I couldn't show them, unfortunately, any properties. So definitely plan things in advance if, if that's what you like to do to come down and buy. Um, as for the, the buying process, it's pretty straightforward. Once you have found a property that you like and you make an offer and it's accepted, the agent, such as myself, will help you through the entire purchasing process. Uh, which just requires certain documents, passport, I, um, proof of address, proof of funds, and I can recommend an English-speaking notaire if you need that. Uh, as for other agents, they can recommend a notaire that you would you would need as well to help you through the process. Uh, an important thing to know is that a notaire in France works for the state; they do not work for the client. So you can have one notaire working for both the buyer and the the seller. That's quite common here in France. Um, once the the dossier has been completed with your agent and sent to the notaire, you will sign the compromis de vente, which is essentially the preliminary deed that, that's being signed at that point. And you do not even need to be in France to do that. Everything can be done by power of attorney uh, and DocuSign. And then there's typically a two to three month waiting period from the time when you sign that compromis de vente and when you actually get the keys handed over to you. And uh, in general, it's a five to ten percent deposit that you will need to make at the signing of the compromis de vente. And once that that has been signed, and you've waited the two to three months, and you 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 come and meet meet with me or another agent to do a final walkthrough of the house, you you sign what's called the acte de vente. Once the acte de vente has been signed, the property is officially yours, and uh, you're you're now a citizen living in France. You have a property in France. And um, I'm sure other people had some questions about the lifestyle, so I won't go too much in general in, into the lifestyle in France, but I would, would be happy to answer any specific questions about, about that or any other specific questions about, uh, about purchasing in France. So uh, I see Ralph, you're, you're here. Thanks for joining us. I've been working with Ralph for, for quite some time to find a property and he'll be joining us again here in the spring. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions too. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I, uh, Annette uh, has come up saying, can you talk about the buying process? So uh, you've done that for us. So Annette, hopefully you listened to what Andrew said there about uh, contacting a lawyer in your home country, but obviously he's taking you through the whole process there. Just quickly, Joanna, um, Andrew mentioned there that if you find an area, is it true that Leggett can then have uh, uh, people that will then send you properties for that specific area in advance of you viewing? Is that correct? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's what we do. We have a sales support team at head office. So if you see a property online, you know the area, you can put a question in. That question will go directly to the agent that mandated the property because they're the best people to talk to because they know the property. Um, but they may be out on the road, et cetera, et cetera. Or you may have chosen 
four or five properties and they're all different agents. So we have a call centre, a, a, a sales support team at head office. So if you're just saying, look, I'd like to look in this area, I haven't seen anything specific, they will put, they will email out all the agents that are in that particular area and get them and send out your criteria of what you're looking for. Those agents will send it back into the sales support person who will then send them on to you. So then you can look at all of those properties prior to even making an appointment and make a short list. And then what the sales support person will do if it's multiple agents, if it's just one agent, the agent will look up after you themselves but if it was multiple agents and you're doing quite a large area the sales support team will put together an itinerary for you and book the appointments with the agent and the agent with the vendors because they'll know the distances between cities or towns etc so they'll plan it well I'd always recommend not seeing more than four in a day um, anyway because it's too many unless you're in a you know you're on a really tight uh, deadline but I would say to try and do maximum of four but the sales support team initially can help you put together an itinerary, speak to all the agents so you have got one point of contact at the start. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, Paulette, uh, a question here basically saying, um, there's a few actually about medical insurance. Uh, they were saying, do you have to have medical insurance cover in place before you go for your TLS appointment? Now, I think the TLS is your long stay application. So it's basically saying, do you have to have medical insurance cover in place before you go for that appointment? So yes, you do need to have it in place, but not active. So the policy needs to, you need to, to have applied for it. It needs to be underwritten and accepted, but it's really important that it's not active. Um, it, it's kind of ready to start because obviously then you don't know the date that you're going to arrive in France. So it needs to be all ready, all ready to go. It's also really important that when you um, go for the appointment that you take just the certificate people think they're being helpful sending the whole pack and you know all the support documents that come with it it just tends to cause confusion um it's definitely best to just just send the certificate um i can't stress that enough just the certificate not everything else that comes with it okay brilliant thank you alex uh, we'll go to you about uh, inheritance tax dan harris asked the question can you explain french inheritance tax and how it affects passing on the property to your children so look french inheritance tax is a huge subject and we can't cover it all all within about five minutes um there's two different aspects to inheriting in france there's for what those of us from the anglo-saxon world may think of as a somewhat strange procedure with the napoleonic code so who do you need to pass on your property or your assets to in terms of your heirs and who can you will your assets to? And then there's actually the taxation itself, um, which occurs in France. So if we just focus on the inheritance tax itself, it actually depends on the relationship that you have with your beneficiary. So for example, uh, if the beneficiary that's going to inherit your house is your children, they, have my, they may have, depending on your estate, a 100,000 euro exemption on the value of the property before they start to get taxed. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can uh, mitigate inheritance tax liability in France. You can use um, something called a use of fruit, where you can start gifting assets and be able to use the assets yourself during your lifetime. So that's one planning method. The other may be to, if, and particularly if you're not American, this probably isn't super tax efficient if you're American, but you could use uh, like an SCI, so a company to buy a property and create a membership or ownership structure that's tax efficient for uh, your heirs. So there are different ways, uh, particularly with property, to start um, planning around inheritance tax. And then just as far as the inheritance issue itself and, and forced heirship of the Napoleonic Code, just in terms of who you can pass what to, it's kind of a separate issue, but there are also uh, planning methods like a Brussels for election um, to kind of mitigate the risk of, of having to pass on assets that you may not want to pass on to certain people. So it's a very, very complex subject, as you would imagine, if you're coming from somewhere like the U.S., where we don't have as much inheritance tax liability or estate planning issues at a certain um, wealth level, you need to be very aware that that those things do occur in France at a much lower level of wealth, um, and depending on who your who your heirs may be. 
Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, just to say, uh, obviously, Alex has said it is a very complex subject, and at the end, there will, all the details of our panelists will be available, so Alex's will be there. So if it is something that you need to ask Alex about, his details will be there, and you can ask obviously ask those questions uh, after this webinar. Okay, let's go to Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan sitting there, uh, patiently waiting for his question. Bryony Williams says, is the exchange of US dollars to euros a different process than exchanging other currencies? In principle, no. Uh, we can handle currencies from all over the world. <clears throat> Aussie dollars, New Zealand dollars, Canadian dollars, uh, obviously pounds and US dollars all into euros. So the actual process of doing the trade would be exactly the same. Uh, you register a trading account and then we'd send you the relevant bank details for the wallet and the currency that you're going to be selling. So we essentially act as an intermediary. <clears throat> so the client would typically send us their funds. We can then sort of track the markets, track the rates for them, and then look to get a trade into their respective currency into euros when required. The differences I'd probably highlight, um, some US um, citizens will find, basically there's some extra regulations that we sometimes have to get around. And um, here at Lumon, we use a special system to handle US clients so we can actually deal with them. Um, some sort of international banking regulations can prove a bit tricky with some US banks actually moving funds around. Uh, the US banking system is obviously uh, very, very large. You think obviously the size of America, um, you know, the banking system there can sometimes be a bit more localized in some certain areas. You get your sort of local banks. So trying to do an international wire can sometimes be a little more complicated. But like I say, Lumina, familiar with this, and we'll talk the client through the process. Um, so yes, certainly in that regard, let's say the actual trading itself is, is very simple, but sometimes there's some extra steps to take in the early stages just to make sure things are set up. So yes, if there's any US clients looking to make that purchase, even though you may not be necessarily at the actual buying stage where you're uh, handing over any money, it's usually a good idea to check some of these things out in advance because it's not always straightforward. As I say, there can often be extra steps to take with the banks in the US just to ensure you've got everything set up. So that would certainly be my uh, advice there. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, let's go to Alison and Joanna. I've, I've had a question that is quite specific, um, but I'm sort of trying to break it down into two parts. So we'll we'll see how we get on there. Holly Breger says uh, she wants to basically set up a glamping site in France. Uh, she mentions a talent passport visa, so I was saying, Alison, first, can you explain what this is and whether it's possible for this sort of business, a glamping business? Yes. So there's a lot of different, there's several different uh, talent passport options. The one we are talking about would be the passport talent entrepreneur. And there are two re main requirements that distinguish this from other business visa types. So the first requirement is going to be that in order to start this business, you have to have either a master's degree or five years of professional experience. So, you know, that we need to show either your degree or uh, different kinds of documents, you know, work pay stubs, pay slips, uh, previous business registrations, things like that to show that you have some kind of experience that will make your business work. It doesn't have to be the exact type of business that you want to start. And then you need to make a 30,000 euro investment in the social capital of the company. So what that means is that you're investing the 30,000 euros in an escrow account uh, before you apply for the visa. Once you arrive in France with your visa, you're going to get that money transferred into the company's account. And that is going to be uh, your company's startup capital. So you could, for example, use that to purchase some of the necessary materials uh, that you're going to use for running the company. So it's possible. Uh, the advantage is that if you have sufficient financial resources and you're running your business, you're going to get a four year cut to séjour right off the bat. It also has uh, special advantages for your spouse so that your spouse can either work in the business or separately in some other kind of job. And that gives you time to get the business to be profitable. Uh, what they're looking at at the end of those four years is, is the company paying you at least French minimum wage? Is it turning a profit? Uh, are you able to live from running your business in France because you're not allowed to do other types of work? So 
I would have to I would have to talk to you on a consultation to figure out sort of what the startup expenses are and what your operating needs are going to be in terms of running the company to see if that is the best option for you. I do like that it gives you a little bit of extra time to, you know, get a business up and running before you have to show that it's profitable. But you can also run camping or jeets or things like that as um, under a profession liberal visa, which is a little bit less complex in terms of application, doesn't require a huge investment, and depending on the in income level, could also be income and expense level could also be a good option. Okay, thanks, Alison. That's um, you just mentioned la professional liberal, and there's a question that's coming on the box from here. Jesse Brown says. I'm looking at a liberal professional visa so I can work for myself. Does my spouse have to work under the same type of visa? Uh, your spouse would not have any special work rights under the Profession Liberal visa. So one of the advantages of the talent passport visa types is the spouse gains the right to work. So they get a special status called Passport Talent Famille Accompagnant, accompanying family member. And that visa grants the spouse the right to do basically any type of work. So uh, if you're starting a company, the spouse can work in the company, they can register as self-employed, they can get a full-time job, they can, you know, work part-time at the local MACDO just to get out of the house. It really doesn't matter what the spouse is doing. There's no minimum amount of income for the spouse. There's no uh, minimum number of work hours. They don't have to get sponsored for the visa. The employer doesn't have to pay any extra tax in order to hire an accompanying spouse of a talent passport holder. With a non-talent passport, like a profession liberal, you have two options. If your spouse is in the same business or a similar or a similar activity, you can do something called a conjoint collaborateur, and that means that your spouse is going to be working in the business uh, that you have. So we have a client; uh, he's a handyman. His wife has been doing, you know, the invoicing and the client calls and the scheduling and all of that stuff. So they're in the same business. They have one set of invoices. They pay one set of ERSAF declarations. They pay a little bit more to uh, cover the, the wife's social charges as well. Um, but they're able to do one visa application on business for them as a couple. And they can do that for up to five years. Um, if the spouse is not in the same business as you, either they have to do their own profession liberal application separately or they have to qualify for another visa type. If they don't qualify for another visa type, uh, the main thing they would be eligible for is a visitor visa, and then they can't work at all. Okay, thank you. We, uh, we'll go back to what the original question was, uh, Holly Breger. I think what she said in the question, Joanna, was that she was going to come with her spouse, so they were gonna try and run this glamping <laughs> visit together. The question for you a bit on the sort of property side, Joanna, is glamping, how easy is, is it to buy land and get permission uh, for a change of use for somewhere to operate a glamping business and also live in, uh, all year round in France? Um, well, the living part is quite simple. Um, the getting permission, buying a piece of land and getting permission to run glamping is actually quite tricky. There's a lot of parts of France, for example, in the Dordogne area where I live, they won't allow any more than what is already here. So if it depends on how many glamping tents you wanted to have as well. So for example, if you see a plot of land and you think, oh, that looks fantastic. If it's got a CU on it, which means you can build on it, it's likely that you might get the license. Um, but I would seriously check with your local mayoree, the agent can help you with that, to go to your local mayoree and find out if that planning is going to be allowed before you go ahead and buy a plot of land. Uh, because plots of land may not even get building permission. Um, and I would definitely make that as a clause of the Compromis de Vente if you are looking at running any sort of business on any plot of land that it is accepted before you go ahead and purchase it. However, there are lots of campsites and lots of um, camping opportunities in France, all over France. It's much easier if you take one over because it's already got the planning, it's already there. You could change it from tents to, or, or mobile homes to glamping tents. That's quite easy because it's already got the permission and it's already there and then you make the business your own. Um, if you're only looking at supplementing your income and you want maybe three yurts in your garden, you can do that anyway. You can just put it up, it would be like running a chambre d'eau. Once you go over five, 
five can be classed if it's a new license as camping à la ferme, which means you're allowed five. You go over that and then there's lots of restrictions. You've got to have the right showers, the right toilets, um, the right sanitary. Everything has to be accounted for and health and safety, of course. So if you're going to go down the road and you want a big glamping business, then I would probably look at trying to take one that's that's already up and running or a tent that you want to change to clamping definitely check with the lo local mary on planning whether that is ever going to be that piece of land is ever going to be allowed to be built on or have tents on um, that's massively important because you can't just buy land and do anything with it um, but once you get it if you can it's a great business to have it's really really popular you know there's over 90 million tourists that visit france every year a lot of them are campers a lot of them are moving around it's a great business to be in glamping is really popular um you know and you can just have a few tents at your house and you don't even need planning for that you can run it like a chambre d'eau as if it was a b and b and have the glamping tents at your own property um but if it's new land definitely take some advice definitely check with the mary and definitely check that you will be able to get planning um because in the green belt areas you probably won't thank you um i hope that answers your question holly uh andrew let's go to you you hinted at this um in your first answer and Chloe Baker has asked, what are the key cultural and lifestyle differences between the US and France that I should be aware of? Oh, that's that's a fun one. I like that question. Uh, the, the first thing I would say would be, um, and I'm an American, I'm from New York, so I've, I've, I'm used to the quick, fast life, fast paced lifestyle. And in France, you, you can't expect to, to come here and, and, and get a million things done in one day. Um, in general, the French love their lunches. They love their two-hour lunch breaks. Um, between 12 and 2, don't think about going to the post office or the bank, things like that. It'll be closed. Um, same with Sundays. Sundays are sacred days in France. You're, you're not going to get much business done on a Sunday. If stores are even open on a Sunday, it's generally going to be until noon, like grocery stores, things like that, maybe 1 p.m., and then they're closed for the day, if they're even open. So I think you kind of have to slow down, especially here in the South, where where people are generally slower life life um, slower slower lifestyle here down in the South of France compared to maybe up in Paris or places like that. Now it can vary from from location to location, but that was one of the um, one of the most difficult not difficult but one of the things that I had to get used to when I first moved to France 12 years ago. It would be like a Sunday and I say, oh, I really want some ice cream, and you just can't. You can't go to the store and pick up an ice cream or uh, things like that like you can, like you can in, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, other than that, I would say if you have 10 things to do in a day, running errands and things like that in the U.S., you could probably get all of them done. Haircut, going to the post office, going to the bank, get your taxes done, things like that. In France, you'll be lucky if you get two of them done. Sometimes, I mean, just simple things like going to the post office can be uh, a, a, big, a big deal or... Um, so you gotta be be um you gotta be prepared for a slower slower life um, lifestyle here. I think that would be the, the biggest. But I, it really pays off. I think I think I really enjoy that now after being here for so long. I really love the the slow paced lifestyle. I've gotten used to it now, and I know um, I know what to expect, and and I really enjoy it now. But uh, that would be the biggest. I don't know if any of you other on the team, uh, Allison or. Andy or uh, any any of you other ones, jo uh, Joanne, if you have any other experience as well, you'd like to add to that, but that would be my, my I, number I think one. Yeah, I think the lovely thing is here, which I had the same coming from London, you know, I thought I could pop out and get a sandwich at three o'clock. No, you can't. If you're not in the restaurant by half past one, you've had it, you know, unless you're in Paris. Um, but the lovely thing is people have time for each other. You know, people stop in the street and talk. Um, you know, and I and I love that. It's really community based. You know, I wouldn't even know who my neighbours were when I was in London. Here, I know the whole village, um, and everyone has time for each other, and that is such a massive difference. And it's such good quality of life. You know, it's all local produce, everything. I absolutely love it. You know, been here 20 years and would never go back. <laughs> that, that's one of my yeah. favourite things. Local produce, you said, Joanna. I think being able to like just bite into an apple or something and know that it just came from a local local farmer or an apricot, things like that, that in the U.S. would probably have come from uh, the other side of the country and there's just no flavor in it and things like that. It's just the, the produce is so much better here. The food, it's so much fresher, the, the bread, the ingredients. Even look at McDonald's French fries have three ingredients, oil, potatoes, and salt. In America, it's like 95 ingredients in just simple French fries. So. 
Okay. I've noticed that a lot of Americans are coming here for the work-life balance. And I'd just like to point out that from a visa residency applying for naturalization perspective, it's actually a really bad idea to work too much to the point that there, there are people who want to obtain French nationality who have been rejected because the average number of hours that they work is too high. And so from the perspective of getting a job or starting a business, you're looking at a standard 35 hour work week. And I really encourage people, if you're doing, for example, a Profession Liberal visa application and you're something like a tutor and you're proposing hourly tutoring services, you want to plan for tutoring 20 to 25 hours a week because the rest of that is your admin and you don't want to be regularly going over 35 hours. So a lot of Americans come for that. We build it into the business plan and Really, if you're coming here, you want to be making that lifestyle change for yourself, I think. Great, thank you. Uh, I love the fact that Andrew picks an apple and it tastes better than any other apple he's ever tasted from the USA. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Um, let's go. I'm from New York. I'm thinking of it, so. <laughs> yeah, of course. Paulette, um, let's go to then, we'll stay with the, the US um, about health insurance. Sally Sullivan says, is the process of getting private medical insurance different for a US applicant compared to someone from the EU? Uh, absolutely not. The, the process to apply for private medical insurance, um, it, it's not um, dependent on your nationality. Um, the, the difference is obviously coming from the EU, people don't necessarily need to have that because they're not applying for a visa. So somebody coming from the US or any country outside of the EU does need to, for a long stay visa, um, that you know they do need to apply for the private medical insurance to accompany the visa application. Um, you know, it, it, I'd say absolutely no. It's, there's no no difference. Nationality doesn't doesn't come into it. Great, thank you, uh, yeah. Jonathan. Uh, let's go, let's go to you. We we'll talk money. Um, Carla Dawson says, if I use a currency specialist, how can I be sure that you have access to the highs and lows of the market so I can get the best deal? And I presume you might waive your gold nugget thing you got there in your hand i bet you've got it in front of you thank you for all the secrets away andy but yes i'll certainly come on to that um just to pick up on where we were there with the difference with the us uh, and france the exchange rate is extremely good at the moment for dollars to euros since the summer since july every hundred thousand dollars buying euros is getting an extra six thousand euros uh, you've had quite a sharp move on dollar euro and it's actually very close to some of the better points of this year again selling us dollars for euros so just really to follow on um, from some of those uh, points so in terms of well i guess the question is asking you know how do we know what's going on in the market um it's a common misconception uh, you cannot accurately predict the forex markets it's just really a reaction to what's going on in the world having said that there is a lot of information out there and you can use sort of past behavior um, experience in the market understanding what's driving the currency markets to try and make some predictions and certainly that's one of the things we'll do when we first speak with a client uh, there's a few different approaches you can take you can take a more sort of defensive strategy uh, to try and protect what you have in terms of your budget clearly when you're moving large six-figure sums what you really don't want to happen is all of a sudden rates move against you and you could potentially be losing thousands and that can make a currency purchase much more expensive than you've bargained for so we'll have a chat with clients about strategy uh, so some clients will be a bit more defensive some are prepared to take on a bit more risk and say well look i don't mind if the rate drops i'm happy to hold on in anticipation of things getting a bit better so once we're looking at that sort of approach a bit more speculative what we can actually do is share with the clients a lot of research um, we consult about 50 different banks looking at all the different forex research that's out there and it gives us quite a range of different predictions and what we'll do is just have a quite a detailed chat with the clients share with them this news and we can give them some probabilities of where certain rates may or may not feature over the coming months we can look at your time scales and say right if you're looking at x amounts transferred in say the next month what's the important news that's coming out uh, for example we've got a very important european interest rate decision uh, a very important american interest rate decision in the next uh, six weeks so these are all key events in the market 
um, may not be something you're immediately uh, excited by at the moment, but certainly if you're looking to move a large amount of money, these can be really, really important events. You know, if I told you your property could suddenly become $5,000 cheaper or potentially more expensive, you know, that might catch your ear a little and make you be a bit more interested. So we can certainly share all sorts of information with clients. And then what we actually have behind that is this um, wallet system that I was referring to earlier, where clients can actually buy their currency. You can lock in rates at certain levels in this wallet. So if you're using the conventional banking system, that can be a bit uh, clunky. Number one, it can be expensive. Uh, so Lumen can demonstrate savings against the US banks and, and other banks in the UK. But if you're using the banks, you've really got to buy currency on the date when it's due. Now, if you consider a French property purchase can take about three months, that's three months you'd have to wait you buy your currency. So we don't know what the rates are going to do tomorrow, let alone in three months time. So using these wallets that we have, you can lock in rates at certain levels and it just gives you a lot more control over the timing and pricing, which should ultimately lead to a much smoother transaction. So, uh, yeah, get in touch to find out more. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Alex, let's go to you. A uh, question about money. Peter Ben says, does France impose national insurance or its equivalent on private pensions? So it depends on where the private pension is coming from, um, is the short answer. The, essentially, what you need to do when you're talking about taxation of pensions and, and whether um, a national insurance contribution or a social charge, let's say, is going to be uh, charged on the pension income is determine where the pension is coming from and then the double taxation agreement that governs how the pension should be taxed. So in this context, if it's a UK private pension, then yes, you can have a French income tax liability and a French social charge liability. There are um, ways to structure taking a UK pension so you can try and mitigate some of those taxes. Uh, and the other thing just to point out in the context of a, a UK private pension is your 25% pension commencement lump sum, which is usually tax-free in the UK, is not considered tax-free in France. And the double taxation agreement that mitigates or that governs the UK and France and who gets to tax what there actually gives the right to France to tax your UK private pension. So um, in the US context, because I know there are quite a few Americans on this, it's actually a completely different consideration. The double taxation agreement between France and the US is very strong and very favorable to Americans. So uh, US private pension would actually be taxed at US tax rates rather than French tax rates. Um, so it's kind of the, the polar opposite and that makes France a very attractive tax jurisdiction to Americans. Okay, thank you. Um, there's been a number of questions from retirees, and they're, they're again, they're one for Alison and one for uh, Joanna. So, Alison, let's start with you. Uh, Deborah Lawrenson says, how straightforward is it for a buyer to now retire in France? It's fairly straightforward. So, if you're retiring in France, there's basically two main things that they're looking for. One is that you have the financial resources to support yourself, and two, that you have that private insurance policy for the uh, for the first year. Now, the private insurance policy, the only visa type that they're looking for it um, at the application level is going to be that visitor visa. Um, so in terms of retiring, it doesn't necessarily help you to already own a property. That's not a consideration that they're, um, you know, that they, that they're taking into account. Um, it does slightly reduce the financial requirement, but if you are renting, if you do not own property, if you do not have, uh, you know, a big savings account, what they're looking for is 1,365 euros per month times 12, and that's good for two people. So it's about 17,000 euros in cash or in a regular monthly pension if you can show that you get U.S. Social Security or a pension or something that is deposited on a regular basis, then then that can also uh, that can also work. Okay, thank you, uh, Jeff Deaton. Uh, Jeff, you've asked the question about the monthly income requirement. I think Alison's just answered that for you, so we can move on from that. Um, Joanna, Rob Renaida says, what is the best strategy? Uh, he's 65. He's semi-retired and wants to the minimal hassle in the process. He's saying, is it best to rent while I house hunt? 
Well, I say if you're 65, get here as soon as possible because you're going to have the best rest of your life that you can. <laughs> but realistically, um, I never. I think if you know your location, as Andrew was saying earlier, if you know the location and you know where you want to be, I would just come and look for the property because you know you're going to spend what happens is you'll you'll rent for a year I mean okay if you haven't found the right property then yes rent for three months rent for six months um, but if you know if you're doing it because of location I would always suggest that you know the location you want to be in first because generally speaking when what I've seen here is when people come here to rent for a year they always end up buying here because they've got to know everyone and they know the area and they love it and they want to stay um, so wherever you go that could happen but I would say, you know, if you're 65, you've done your research, you know the location, then find the property. It's going to save you a year's worth of money that just going down the drain in rental, um, unless, you know, you're not sure of the area. But I would say, you know, spend your time looking for the right property. If you, you, you may need to rent, you know, maybe over a three or four month, pro, pro, you know, period while the property's going through. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to rent. Most of our buyers come here, they've researched their area and they come to fight, they, they come to buy. Um, you know, and at the moment it's quite a good time to buy. The market's stabled out, the interest rates have gone up for the local domestic market. So, you know, you've got a good chance of getting a really good property now. And why wait? You know, come and find your dream home and, you know, get into it and live in it rather than in someone else's. That's that's how I would what I would say. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna stay with you, uh, Joanna, because uh, this question did come in from Karina uh Rina Vogan. And she's also put a question back up on the box. She's very key to the answer. So I was going to ask it, Karina, and I'll ask it now. Joanna, she says, I need to sell my property in the UK in order to buy in France. Will the French seller be OK to wait if I made an offer on their property? Generally speaking, in the market we're in at the moment, probably not, um, because, you know, you, how long, we don't know, that the vendor doesn't know what your property's like in the UK, is it marketed correctly, it might be a chain in the UK and could take nine months to a year to sell, which means the vendor's losing opportunities. It really depends on the situation of the vendor and the property itself. If it's, say, an inheritance and, you know, they're quite happy to wait because you've, you know, signed something to say, you know, you've got a letter from your solicitor in the UK and everything else then yes they might be prepared um, but they would still have to be some sort of timeline on it it can't be unconditional because once the vendor has signed the compromis de vente they're stuck with that so you know if it took you five years that vendor then can't sell it to anyone else for five years so they would have to be some sort of time frame um, but I would say the best bargaining position you're in as well and for making offers is when you've sold so I would start looking when your property is under offer um, you're in a much better position for making offers etc um, and also you're much more likely for the vendor to accept that to wait for, till it completes okay thank you uh, hopefully that answers your question Karina um, Andrew let's go to you um, Jonathan's already mentioned the strength of the US dollar um, against uh, the euro uh, Philip Petrovich says uh, the dollar seems to be very strong at present and so a house purchase in France is very attractive but I'm reading that the housing market in France may take a downturn are you predicting a fall or increase in French property prices? Oh, that's a good question. So I would start by saying that the last few years have been the strongest years on record in, in France, at least in the past 20 years. Um, in Legate at any rate, the last 23 years, uh, the last few years have been the two of the strongest. So what I think is happening right now, uh, I would say is the, the market is coming back to normal. I wouldn't say that the market is crashing. Uh, I would say it's 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 stabilizing now. Um, it's it's not going to be increasing right now at this point because interest rates are high. Um, but I would say that in long term, over a period of ten years, in general, France is a really great place to invest because not only is is the is the price of of a property pretty stable throughout the ten years? It's it's always increasing over a ten year period. But we don't have the peaks and the crashes like the market would in the US or in the UK, for example. So I would say that the, the market is very stable right now. Uh, it's, a, it's a great time to invest, especially if you have dollars. I, I'm a person who believes in being cash poor. I think it's great to, to put your money in, in, in real estate rather than sitting with cash in, in a bank account that's, that's just earning nothing or actually you're losing because of the, um, because of the inflation rate. So, uh, I hope that answers your question, and um, we'll we'll see if anybody else has any similar questions to that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Paulette, let's go to you. We've obviously uh, mentioned a lot about uh, U.S. buyers uh, on this webinar. Um, 
Alan Porter says, as an American, if I purchase a French holiday home, is my home insurance policy price going to be greater as I cannot visit as regularly as a French or European citizen? The really good news, um, we don't ask, well, obviously we know where our client's uh, main home is, um, but the system doesn't ask, you know, where, where does the owner live? Um, you're going to pay exactly the same price as somebody who lives in France who's bought a second home in France. It's just as soon as we mark the property as unoccupied for more than 90 days a year, and that's cumulative, not per per period of inoccupation, so more than 90 days in the whole year, then it then it marks it as a second home and you get the, a slight increase in price, not, not massive at all. Um, the thing you need to remember is if the property is going to be empty for a long time, say over the winter, um, some policies might request that you uh, drain your water system um, between, say, October and April. Um, it's always, we would always, always recommend that you leave a key with either a neighbour bought or ideally with like a hand holder um, who can say if there's been a storm you can request that somebody goes along and, and checks you know if you suddenly got a hole in the roof and um, because also if you think if that happens and then you're you're not visiting the property nobody's looking at the property for you for six months which we found quite a bit in, in covid people won't get into properties as regularly um you know there's the the property's almost ruined um, because like water has been pouring in for months. So I would definitely, definitely recommend that even if you don't have a handholder that goes in to maintain the property for you, that you, you at least have a handholder where you can leave the key and they can check on it for you if, if need be. But don't worry, no extra penalties for the fact that you don't live in France and it's a second home. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, let's go to you. Mark Reardon says, if I purchase a property as a company, are there disadvantages under French law or, and also is it advisable to buy under a company? Actually, it just really depends on your situation. Um, there may be some advantages depending on what you're looking to get out of buying within a company. There may be some disadvantages, particularly if you are a U.S. taxpayer, a U.S. tax resident. It's probably not the way forward. Um, but if you are not a U.S. taxpayer, then there could be some advantages, particularly in terms of um, if you used like an SCI to, to try and create a tax efficiency on the inheritance side. There are some structures as well that are fiscally transparent for French tax purposes. So you may not be creating necessarily tax efficiency. I think whenever you're looking at creating uh, layers in any kind of transaction, like using a company to buy a property, you need to step back and think about why you're doing that, what you're looking to achieve with it, and whether it's achieving your purpose. A lot of people are going to tell you that you should do this or you should do that for tax efficiency purposes. It's not always applicable to your particular situation. So it's important to understand what you're looking to get out of adding extra layers and complications into any process and seeing if that's going to achieve it with without adding unnecessary stress or strain. Um, and certainly if you're a US taxpayer, not a good idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alison, uh, this one's from Susan Harris Doyle. Is there a one-stop info shop for EU and US citizens seeking a permanent move to France? And I presume you could probably sell your own company here if you wanted to, but perhaps be a little yeah, bit- Yeah, I was, I was gonna say like, there is, her name is Alison. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, our company kind of provides comprehensive relocation services, except for the housing piece. Um, we don't do apartment searches or property searches, um, but we have many fine people here who do. Other than that, we really try to be comprehensive and provide guidance from, you know, about six months before people are planning their move, um, a lot of the different things they should anticipate getting all of the documents ready, getting all of the all of the pieces in place, doing the visa application, and then um, a lot of the things that need to be done afterwards, whether we're doing it as part of our package or there are some things that like, if you're bringing your pets, we can't bring your pets to the vet for you. Um, you know, we can't, uh, we can't get your children vaccinated. Um, you know, we can enroll your children in school, but you need to actually go to the town hall. So for anything that we can't physically do for you, uh, you know, we're providing resources, we're providing uh, checklists and videos and explanations of how to do it and answering your questions um, and, and all of that. So we work with many US and UK citizens 
um, that includes the visa piece. We also do work with uh, EU citizens and their partners. Uh, the partner needs to apply for a cast de séjour upon arrival in France if the if they're the spouse of an EU citizen, but not EU citizens themselves. Um, if they're the spouse of a French citizen, it's visa before you come. The rules are different. Uh, so yeah, I would encourage you to reach out for us. Um, reach out to us for for help with that. Okay, thank you. We're conscious of time, but you've mentioned it a couple of times, Alison. Can you just quickly say what a carte de séjour is? Because I okay. mentioned. At the time, suggest people think, well, well, what's she talking about? Okay, so there are three important terms that you need to know, and they're used kind of interchangeably, and they mean almost the same thing, but they're not exactly the same thing. So when you go to VFS or TLS, you're going to apply for a visa. Now, if you are applying for visitor, student, salarié, uh, uh, salaried worker, uh, spouse of a French citizen. There are a bunch of visa types called VLSTS, which is Visa Long Séjour Valent Titre de Séjour. So this is a visa that is valid for 12 months. When you arrive in France, you validate it online. And that is going to turn it into something called a Titre de Séjour, which is your renewable right to remain in France. There are also some visa types that are called VLST, which is for uh, visa de long séjour temporaire, and those are not renewable, or they're only renewable like up to a limited time, so 12 months plus six months, for example. A t uh, then when you renew your 12-month visa, you get a cast de séjour, and that is the physical plastic residency card that can be valid for one year or 10 years, you know, or anywhere in between. There's also the 90-day visas, which um, if you're applying for a talent passport, you get a 90-day visa first, and then you have to apply for your cast de séjour right immediately when you arrive in France within those first 90 days. And then you can get a two to four year cast de séjour physical plastic card right off the bat. So we kind of broadly refer to visa titre de séjour, cast de séjour a little bit interchangeably. The difference would be whether or not it's renewable. The cost de séjour is like the physical plastic card and not just like the theoretical administrative right to stay for a period of time that exists somewhere in the French government's computer system, which would be your titre de séjour. Okay, thank you. Uh, you'll see there that Jonathan has changed the page, so all of our panelists' details are there in front of you. And I think if you are uh, considering applying for a visa to come to France, I think uh, contacting someone like Alison uh, is probably worthwhile because as she said there, there are obviously things that you need to make sure you get right and you don't want to get it all wrong. Uh, Joanna, I'm going to quickly try and get this one in for, uh, to you because we've talked about people buying properties. Obviously, if you bought a property, there are obviously charges, uh, yearly charges. And Stephen Parkinson says, what are the additional yearly property charges and have they gone up recently? Um, well, they did, they would go up with inflation like anything else does, but there's two taxes. There's the tax foncière and the tax habitation. Uh, they're the two property taxes that you'd pay. Um, recently, if you are a resident in France and you live in one property, they've, they're have they dropping the tax habitation, so you'd only have the tax foncière. If it's a second home, you would pay the tax habitation on the second home as well as the tax foncière. But they're the only two property taxes that you pay in France. Right. Um, as always, we've run out of time. Uh, it's uh, uh, 6.59, uh, 7.59 here in France, and we've run out of time. I'm uh, just going to let you know that on November the 2nd is our next uh, webinar, and that's an Alp special. We did one uh, probably about a month ago. If you're keen on buying in the Alps or a holiday home or a permanent move to the Alps, we have some Alps specialists. They won't be wearing bubble hats and uh, dressing ski gear. They will just be normal people who will tell you all about uh, buying in the Alps. Um, we've run out of time and I'd like to thank my panellists and again we will just quickly go around if they've got something burning to say uh, they can say it quickly. Uh, thanks for joining us as I say November the 2nd is an out special you can register for that and also this webinar has been recorded and uh, you can uh, watch it back. If there's anyone you think oh they're very very attractive I'd like to look at them again and again or hear about Andrew and he's buying uh, eating his apples uh, you can obviously look back again it would be lovely. Uh, let's say cheerio then from Joanna. Uh, yeah, bye everyone. Thank you ever so much for coming along and hope to see you again on the next webinar. And also, obviously, all the information is on our website, legitfrance.com. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you from Alison. Thanks so much for having me. I do have a foolproof French visas, which is my complete guide to everything about the visa process, including 
selecting the right visa type and applying for it. And that is available on Amazon as a paperback or on our website. And please do feel to reach out, uh, feel free to reach out about the visa process. Thank you. Uh, say, thank you, Alison. Let's say cheerio from Andrew. Thank you everybody for having me. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions about moving to the sunny south of France in Carcassonne or the old region, feel free to reach out to me. You can see my contact details here. And also check out my YouTube channel where I uh, post video tours of a lot of the properties that I sell on YouTube. Just search Andrew Guck and you'll you'll find me uh, there. Thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for Paulette. Thank you, Paulette. We didn't get too many questions from you. I'm sorry about that, but thank you. That's okay. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, thank you from uh, Alex. Thanks for having me. If anyone has any financial planning or tax related questions, feel free to get in touch on my email, which is listed below. Have a great day. Thank you. And Jonathan, finally from you. Yes. Thank you everyone for watching. Do get register with us if you'd like to get some of the latest market research forecasts over the next 12 months. If you're considering a property purchase in that period, could be some really useful information. But yeah, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to our panelists and a big thank you to you as always, Andy, for hosting. Have you got that piece of paper there in front of you? The, the, the gold, as you call it? Yeah, this is the pound euro one for uh, display purposes, but we've also got dollar euro, Canadian dollar euro, any currency pair, New Zealand dollar, whatever you need. Can I just make one suggestion? I know we're running out of time, but you keep waving that in front of you. You call it gold. It would be quite nice if the paper was actually gold and not black. Just to, okay. I, that might sell it a bit more to people. Okay, okay. good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us. You can see there all of our panelists' uh, details are there. Joanna, Andrew, Jonathan. Alex, Alison and Paulette, if you have any questions, they, they will be willing to answer them by email and you can get in contact with them. As I say, November the 2nd is our next webinar. If you fancy buying a holiday home or a permanent home in the Alps, uh, we'll see you then. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, take care. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Ciao. Bye.